the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Namaste. Got a whole new setup. <laughs> well, today I want to talk about how an ashram is managed when it's managed well and successfully. And I call that the good guru, bad guru routine. Huh? You've ever seen on cop shows, they do the good cop, bad cop act when they're interrogating a suspect they've got the guy in the room with the hot lights on right and usually the bad cop goes first and maybe he roughs him up you know and he, he won't believe anything he says and he's just really giving him a hard time so after a while after the guy has softened up a little bit the bad cop takes a break and the good cop comes in and he's like, oh, buddy, buddy, hey, have a cup of coffee. You need a cigarette, whatever, you know. And usually the good cop is the one that gets the confession. Isn't it? So the similar thing is going on in a well-run temple. But instead of good cop, bad cop, it's good guru, bad guru. <laughs> in North India... These two gurus have names. The good guru is called Satguru, and the bad guru is called Upasguru. The Satguru represents Jupiter energy, and he's all smiles and namaste, welcome to the temple, would you like some food, you know? <laughs> and then he you know, he's very kind to everyone. He never gets upset. He never yells at anybody. Everybody loves the good guru. Then there's the bad guru, the upas guru. And he's like, why didn't you give a donation? You're late for the artik. <laughs> you didn't memorize your verses for the class. You know, he's always chastising. He's always acting as a disciplinarian. And everybody hates the Upas Guru. In the temples where I was trained by my Adi Guru, we always had two leaders in the temple. And in that context, they were called the temple president and the temple commander. The temple president was supposed to be the good guru and the temple commander was supposed to be the bad guru. That's how it's supposed to work. So when I got a chance about 15 years ago to start my own ashram, I had the same arrangement. I was the upas, no, I was the satguru, <laughs> except when I got angry and started yelling at people. And there was another devotee, my uh, first disciple, who was the upas guru. He was a disciplinarian. He was supposed to keep everybody in line. The only problem was he didn't. <laughs> he would take sides with the devotees against me. That's why I had to start yelling. But when it worked, it worked very well. And we were able to get a really nice ashram going, plenty of donations flowing in and so on and so forth. And this was because we had the act down. Huh? Good guru, bad guru. I gave the classes, I was always reading from the scriptures, or chanting mantras, or leading kirtans, or, you know, like that. And he was always, come on, it's time for you to get up. Come on, let's go. It's time, you have to chant your rounds. You have to chant your mantras. You have to study now. It's time to study. Come on. Are you, what time you go in the kitchen? 10 o'clock? You better get in there now, you're late. You know, he was always on everybody's case until he discovered that he wanted to actually be the big guru himself. 
That's when he started taking sides against me and counteracting my instructions with his own. And that led to the downfall of the whole thing after another year or two after he started that. Because to tell you the truth, I got demotivated. I lost interest. I was like, look, everything I'm trying to do doesn't work out because you're always giving some other instruction. And he's like, well, you know, the, the other devotees say this and say that. I said, like, I don't care. This is not about their opinion. They're not self-realized. They're not the ones who spent 25 years in study in Prabhupada's temples. Huh? And that would straighten him out for a while, but then he'd do it again, you know. So eventually the whole thing crashed. And it crashed because there were some devotees there, some, some so-called disciples, who wanted to use the ashram as a front for illegal business. And I caught on to this because I'd seen it so many times before. I know all the signs. And I also know the signs when somebody is trying to usurp the guru because I saw it happen to all my gurus. My Adi guru got usurped by the leadership of uh, the GBC, you know, the leadership committee that he established. And they basically formed uh, a counter organization, a, a hidden organization against him, cut him off from the rest of the devotees and then ran things their own way, act, you know, putting out the message that they were his representatives giving his orders, except they weren't giving his orders. <laughs> they were, had their own ideas. This also happened to my guru's guru. And it was the same thing. He created a governing body commission, a, a committee, and they cut him off from the rest of the devotees and were speaking in his name, but giving different directions and so on. And the whole thing became corrupt. So this is the story. And I've seen it happen here in South India. I saw it happen in different ashrams, some very well-known ashrams here in Tiruvannamalai. <clears throat> and, uh, the same thing is going on where the managers deviate from the actual instructions of the guru, sometimes resulting in the guru's death. It can get pretty serious, pretty heavy. So you might already understand that this is not something I want to do. <laughs> on the other hand, I would like to have more influence and more impact on the lives of the people who follow these teachings. And to do that, I would need to have my own bad guru. <laughs> I'm not temperamentally suited to be the upas guru. I'm not the kind of guy who can be like, always on the rules and regulations. Because for one thing, at my stage of realization, I see that all hierarchies, all organizations are simply fabrications. <laughs> They're simply paper tigers. They're simply big piles of words and, and symbols, roles and names. So these artificial forms don't have any real existence to me. On the other hand, to the people who are still covered by ignorance, they need names and forms. They need structure. They need discipline. And without the discipline, they cannot do the necessary process to change their being. We just had an experience of that in our course site. I started a course, maybe you remember, about six weeks ago. I started a, a section of matrix learning. Matrix learning is a pretty tough course. You can take a look at it here. 
So some people signed up and we got the course going and everybody was all gung ho, you know, and enthusiastic and yeah, we're going to do this and like that. But as we got into the course, I could tell they weren't really doing the work. They didn't really believe, first of all, the premise of the course. They didn't really believe that misunderstood terminology can have a huge impact on your life in all kinds of ways. And of course, the main impact that we were looking at was how misunderstood terminology keeps you from learning and keeps you from applying what you learn. And in spiritual life, this is deadly. If you can't learn things efficiently and then apply what you learn in your actual life, well, what's the use of it? It's just theory. It's just words. But we've been trained up, we've been conditioned by the educational system to just learn words and be able to recite them even though we have no idea what they mean. So to actually uh, get the benefit of this process, the disambiguation of misunderstood terminology, a, lot, a bunch of big words, <laughs> but what it means is you have to look up words in the dictionary and especially the short, small, commonly used words like if, that, such, but, for, when, out, up, and so on. These little one-syllable words have so many different meanings in the English language that if you can't disambiguate them, then you will wind up getting completely confused. And this is what happens to most people who try to learn in the English language. But these guys never really bought into that. And we also presented the uh, influence of name and form on the process of becoming and specifically on consciousness. You can, you can read about it in the course or you can watch the videos. So I don't think they really believed that. It was just theory to them. It wasn't real. And so they never put the energy required to actually apply the process that I taught them of how to look up misunderstood terms, how to recognize them, how to uh, find the definitions, how to uh, clear them according to context, how to use them in sentences, and so on and so on. They never really got that. They never really went through, for example, and cleared up their old misunderstandings of grammar that they got when they were in school. So because of this laziness, because of this entitled attitude, when we got to the hard part of the course, the part on ontology, oh boy, they hit the wall, washed out, finished. 80% of the people in the course dropped out without saying anything. They just stopped showing up. So this is a symptom of misunderstood terms. I know this. I've been teaching this stuff for decades, okay? I had professional level training in it. So I know, I know about the symptoms. So when they hit this wall of misunderstood terminology, I let them stew for a couple of weeks. They got nowhere. And then the symptoms started getting worse. They started finding fault with me, saying I didn't know what I was talking about, and started to introduce all kinds of weird material off topic, out of context, by other writers and you know people who had nothing to do with the course or what they were supposed to learn. These are classic symptoms of misunderstood terms. So anyway, the whole thing failed. Why did this happen? Because there was no discipline. There was no upas guru to look over their shoulder and say, did you complete this? Did you do that? Did you do this right? Have you finished looking up your words? And so on, and get them through the process. Huh? 
That's not my role. It's not my character. It doesn't suit my temperament. So it's really something that, that I would need. If I'm going to go on with this teaching business, you know, if I'm going to go, go on with uh, actually training people to liberate themselves from illusion, I'm going to need somebody to be the bad guru. <laughs> but it has to be someone completely dedicated and trustworthy. So it's like... Good luck, Swamiji, <laughs> finding somebody like that, you know? Because everybody I have worked with has gone through this same, same uh, transformation, this same drama of in the beginning they make a big commitment and they say, yeah, I'm with you all the way, I'm going to help you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to organize that, I'm going to manage this, whatever, so you can just teach. And I'm, yeah, great. But after a while, they start to become like envious or something. And of course, what it is, is that misunderstood terms are building up. And the emotional charge due to the misunderstood terms is building up. And because they cannot acknowledge and recognize the actual source of the emotional stress, they blame it on me. I've seen it happen a hundred times because I happen to have a very high IQ. And my whole life, without even trying, I managed to say things that confuse people because they don't know the terminology. I'm sorry. I use the words that mean the things that I intend to say. So if I have to use a four-syllable word, I'll use it, okay? I have a very large vocabulary. I've cut it way down because I'm tired of people misunderstanding me. So now me talk very simple compared to my actual knowledge of the language, but that's neither here nor there. The point is the same emotional drama has played out in so many relationships in my life, I'm ready to move into a cave. I mean, seriously. I'm ready to just sit here in my studio and read nice stories from the scriptures and compose nice original background music for them and just make nice, t nice videos that won't offend anybody, that won't challenge anybody, you know that just uh, are nice. Because I'm sick and tired of people when I try to actually instruct them, wind up blaming me for their confusion. See, in spiritual life, the onus is completely on the student. It's completely on the disciple. They're the ones who are suffering. They're the ones who are confused. They're the ones who are in trouble. I'm done, man. I'm free. I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm in bliss, except when I have to deal with these rascal students. So either, you know, Arunachala sends me a partner who can do the needful and play the role of the Upas Guru, and then we can build something up and it'll be very effective. Or I just have to, you know, go merrily down the road in my way uh, because I don't want to get entangled with people's negativity. Uh, I don't want to become a target for their repressed anger and emotional charge due to their own laziness and lack of understanding of the process that I've given them, their own unwillingness to apply the instructions. Huh? I don't want to be the, the get blamed for that. It sucks, number one. And number two, it's an offense. It's an offense to the realized soul. And because of that, they have to suffer more. It winds up just increasing their bondage instead of liberating them which is completely the opposite of the effect that I want to have. 
So it's completely counterproductive for me to try to teach people without an effective structure in place. And so I'm not going to do it anymore. Unless somebody comes along who, you know, is qualified to form a team and to work together with me and uh, make something happen. Otherwise, I'm just going to become, you know, the nice Satguru. Yes, yes. You know, Rama Rama. <laughs> and sit in my studio and compose nice music, you know, because I just want to have a pleasant life. I've earned it. Huh? I'm qualified for it. I don't need any of this drama. I don't need any of this bullshit. I don't need to be in competition with my disciples. It's such a weird, I mean, forget it. I don't want it. So I'd rather not take disciples. I'd rather not try to teach anybody then have to go into that same old drama again because I am thoroughly sick and tired of it. Thank you very much. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung.